school is in session, and while we all want our kids to learn, what's really on the minds of our educators, parents, and our kids as they start this new school year? Common Core goes into effect this year. How should we evaluate our teachers and our schools, and what's the best way to help our kids learn? Stay tuned. And on Stay Tuned, you drive the discussion. We bring local experts, journalists, and civic leaders together to have tough conversations for a stronger St. Louis. Tweet us your insights on tonight's topic, and you've got a seat at the table. With a few national experts and a panel of community members, this is the show bringing more light and less heat to the issues that matter. So stay tuned. Okay, so tonight we've got a couple of things we want to accomplish. We're going to try to demystify this whole Common Core discussion just a little bit. We also want to talk about what's working, and there are a lot of things in the headlines that have to do with education that uh, we want to kind of get caught up on here to help us do that. Dale Singer from St. Louis Public Radio. Dale, I have uh, six minutes and uh, approximately six questions for you, so we'll do these kind of uh, uh, somewhat rapid fire. How does Let's that sound? Do okay, so uh, let's start, start with Common Core. Uh, this is a hot topic for people. Common Core is a uh, set of standards that has been adopted by more than 40 states nationwide and had been adopted by Missouri as well. There was a law that, uh, a bill that was passed and signed into law by Governor Nixon. That means Missouri's gonna kind of reset things and while Common Core will take effect this year, as far as testing goes, there will be panels of educators and others meeting throughout the state to try to put their own uh, standards together for Missouri. Where this has happened in other states, the names changed, the standards haven't changed all that much, but it, it remains to be seen what happens. Uh, in Missouri, the complaint was that there wasn't enough public input, that there wasn't enough public notice, or pub even public attention. Sometimes these things slip through without people paying much attention until it's already done, and I think that was the case here. So they'll be starting all over. Um, something that a lot of people have paid attention to, whether they are in the sending or receiving districts, was the school transfers that we've heard so much about. Where do we stand with school transfers? School transfers are still very much with us. Um, the State Board of Education tried to limit the transfers out of Normandy by giving the state, the state giving it a different uh, accreditation status so that the state law that says students who live in unaccredited districts could move elsewhere would no longer be in play. A judge in St. Louis County said the state board didn't go about that in the right way, so the number of uh, students who can transfer from Normandy to the districts that they attended last year uh, has increased greatly. Every district uh, that received transfers last year, except for Francis Howell, has said they will receive them now. Francis Howell is only accepting the students that the court says they have to. So uh, the lawyer who's been bringing these lawsuits keeps coming back with smaller group, small groups of students. And every time so far, the judge has said, okay, these students can transfer. So I believe tomorrow he's supposed to go into court and do some more. So the transfers law is still very much with us. And the financial threat to Normandy is still very much with us because while the state wanted to decrease the amount of tuition that Normandy would have to pay, that apparently isn't going to happen either, and districts can charge whatever uh, they want to charge as far as tuition for the students that they receive. Uh, we had some test scores out. Uh, Missouri, School Improvement or, uh, uh, Missouri School Improvement Program scores, uh, MSEP as we often right. refer to it. Anything noteworthy there? Well, last year um, was I think people hoped that Normandy would show some improvement. Instead, they actually went down. I believe the, they only got 7% of the points that they could. So they've got a, a, dip, a bigger hole to dig themselves out of. Two of the other districts around here who, that were uh, had scored low, Riverview Gardens and St. Louis Public, showed significant gains. So they, while they're still under the 50% mark that uh, would give them a provisional accreditation, they're at least moving in the right direction. One of the other districts that was provisionally accredited, which is Jennings, scored a big gain, and they're now in uh, full accreditation uh, 
territory. State board has said they're not going to generally not going to make any real changes until they've got three years of MSIP data. They only have two now. But at least the uh, numbers that came out last week show some definite directions that some districts are going mostly up, some down. Amendment three coming in November to the ballot box. What, what's uh, the situation there? The situation there is that uh, there was a petition drive. They turned in enough signatures and they want to change the teacher tenure law in Missouri. They want to shorten contracts. They want to make it easier for uh, districts to replace teachers who have been there for a while with other teachers. So uh, there will be a whole different set of criteria that could be used for determining whether or not a uh, teacher would still have a job instead of lifetime contracts. There, I believe the contracts would be limited to three years. You can get rid of a tenured teacher now, um, and unions point that out and say it's just a question of due process. And other the people who were in favor of Amendment 3 say, no, it's really not helping the kids if teachers can stay entrenched as opposed to, say, a, a new teacher who's really good, but if a district has to lay off teachers, it's uh, last in, first out. So right now, Amendment 3 is on the ballot. There was a lawsuit that was filed uh, to try to block it. Judge said last week, or I guess ruled this week, that uh, it can stay on the ballot, but that ruling is going to be appealed. Uh, Dale, we are, our six minutes are up. We only got through about four or five topics, but the answers were so good, uh, we're giving you an A. Uh, well, thank you very uh, much. Nonetheless, thanks, I appreciate uh, Dale that. Singer, St. Louis Public Radio. Uh, this is a conversation that we're having tonight you can't have without teachers. Our own Anne Marie Berger sat down and got some uh, very candid conversations with our educators. Is this the best time of the year? That first couple of weeks at school? Is everybody really excited because nobody's nobody's burnt out yet? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to get up as early as you do and and you know, you don't get to sit on your computer and go on Facebook all day when you feel like having some downtime. What, what's, a, what's a good day at work? You come home and you think, oh, that was a good day. I always like that aha moment when I used to teach like books and um, we'd be having some sort of discussion over a passage and you see that, you see that look on the kids' faces when they would actually understand what the, what the writer was trying to say. I had a student today that used one of our vocabulary words from two weeks ago in his own writing. This is a first grader. And so just, you know, it was just one of those things he just knew what the word meant and he wanted to use it in his writing. And he brought it to me and he was so proud. And then when I read it, I was just ecstatic. I'm like, oh my gosh, this was one of our words. He said, I know. You know, they have a choice, man. They can walk out in the hallway and they can start talking about whatever movie, TV show, or musical artist, you know, but they're out the door talking about like, decline of the Ottoman Empire or something, you know what I mean? Which is like <laughs> obscure history that, you know, I'm like, oh man, that is, that's nice. You know, and then, you know, the rest of the day you're just walking on cloud nine um, because kids in the hallway are talking about what you just taught them, so. Do these aha moments that you have, these things that motivate you when you see uh, the progress, do they happen often? Mm -hmm. I think they can happen every day. Mm -hmm. I think it's the lens that you want to take. And not that you want to take, but that you choose to take, that you, you open your eyes to see the greatness that is happening throughout the day. How important is it that you need to know that your administration, your principal is saying, you know, go do what you gotta do without the bureaucracy and the, the red tape and all the things that get in the way of teaching and making those connections? I think it's critical. I think it's 100% a make or break for a school, for um, the teachers in that school, for the kids in that school, for the community. I think it's, it's from the top down and when you have an awesome administrator, everybody feels comfortable, everybody's ready to learn, the kids feel good. We need the kind of support from our administrators that's the same kind of support we're giving to our students. You know, we need that, you know, we need to have goals just like we want our kids to have goals, but we need to have positive feedback and we need to be, you know, critiqued and have, you know, more goals put in place. You know, a school system is, is a lot like a family, and when you don't have that overarching support, then it, it is not impossible, but it is very challenging to move forward and meet the goals that everybody is saying around you, you want to put in place. You know, come November, Amendment 3 is on, on the ballot. What is Amendment 3, and, and how do those of you in the room feel about it? It is an amendment that focuses teachers on standardized tests, because it requires that teachers are evaluated by their kids' test scores, which in my eyes really 
kind of forces teachers to view kids as numbers. Every community is different, and you know, with this amendment, it makes tries to make everything um, on an even plane, but at the same time, we know as, as teachers, uh, everybody learns differently. I don't think that that test is going to show us everything we need to know. What does define quality learning? I think taking a student from where they're at to where they need to go. So you can't just say everybody's going to end up at this same point by the end of the year. You want to take them where they're at now and hope and know that they will grow. But they all grow at their own different pace. And so you don't want to say this standardized test is going to measure. And if you don't meet that, you're a failure hmm. or you're behind. The test is just one data point. It's not enough to, to value someone's education on. It kind of kills what makes teaching great. What does make teaching great? You know, you guys kind of pick the hardest profession you can have, where sometimes not all people, but underpaid and underappreciated. It's it's challenging. Um, why why do it? Where, what is it? You talked about the passion and what makes being a teacher great. Explain it to me. I think the relationships that you build, um, to me, are priceless. Uh, for me personally, um, building that relationship with that child um, and taking them from one point to the other um, satisfies my, my soul, basically. Um, I, I, it's something that I, I yearn to do. I like to make a difference. What are, what are things that work, whether they're, you see them now or things that you wish would take place? I meet my students at the door every day, and I say, hi, how are you, as they come in the door. Just that simple interaction can make all the difference in the world. I'd love to see uh, a free preschool available to every child in this country. Do you see a difference when kids enter kindergarten, can you say, okay, they've had some early childhood classes, development? There's such a difference between two five-year-olds that one who has been in a family that has a lot of rich language and goes to a nice preschool or even stays home with a parent that takes care, and then another five-year-old that has not had that exposure and may be living in poverty, and we have suburban and urban and rural poverty in Missouri, and it's growing, and so we're seeing these children come in that are at such a difference at five years old, and so if you already are at this kind of a difference every year, it just keeps getting larger and larger. That's where the legislators could start stepping up. Yes. and start putting their money into our early childhood education. I just want to end on one thing. Are you guys going to be this enthusiastic in May? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Unless Amendment 3 passes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be enthusiastic yeah. anymore. <laughs> okay, we have with us in studio someone to give us the state's perspective, a little bit of an inside perspective uh, from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Margie Van Dieven, uh, Deputy Commissioner for Learning Services. Let's talk about the Common Core. Let's talk about INSEP. Uh, but let's start with Common Core. Okay. Uh, this is um, something that generates a lot of passion from a lot of people, uh, but, but it's not exactly new. It goes into effect this year in Missouri, but it's, it's, we've had it in Missouri. Is that right? That's correct. We're, we're actually entering into almost our fourth year of working towards this. Uh, the impl full implementation of the of the new revised standards and one of the things I'd like to point out is that we have academic standards for all content areas and when we're talking specifically about the common core that's the term that's used nationally in Missouri when we call them the Missouri learning standards we're specifically talking about the English language arts standards and the mathematics standards uh, when we're when we're referencing the common core so you can use those two terms interchangeably uh, but it is important to, to note that we're, we're specifically talking about English language arts and mathematics in that so area. the others don't apply they, they, we still have them in place, but they are not being revised at this point in time. So the, the, new, the new standards going into play are the English language arts and mathematics. Uh, I enjoyed seeing the enthusiasm of the teachers on your previous clip. We're, we're hearing that kind of enthusiasm about finally being here and able to fully implement the standards. Though not everyone's enthusiastic about it. Some people think that this is going to tie the hands of teachers. What do you say to that? Well, I think uh, Dale probably addressed that well. Uh, we haven't heard a lot of concern about the standards themselves. It's more about the processes and about some of the supporting, document, uh, the supporting materials that could be used. Again, it's really important for people to understand that the standards are simply that. They just say what students should know and be able to do. <laughs> Curriculum is still a local decision. I think there was a lot of confusion about what the, the how we're going to implement the standards. That is still left up to the local districts, local school boards, the materials that will be used to support that um, fully at the hands of the local of the local schools. And so I think um, once the people, uh, as, as Dale also mentioned, we'll be having some work groups coming in starting at the end of the month. 
and fully reviewing English language arts mathematics. They will also be looking at science and social studies, even though those are not under revision right now, and uh, providing some good feedback on, on what they would like to see in those standards. As an educator, tell me why we need these Common Core standards. I think there's a lot of reasons. Probably we want to think about uh, how the whole process originated, and that really was um, looking at um, the amount of remediation, the, the, the remedial coursework that was needing to take place in, in uh, colleges. Uh, a lot of our workforce was coming to us saying, you no, know, kids qu aren't quite prepared to enter the workforce <laughs> ready. So we, we'd back map. The states came together and said, what does that mean? Instead of having uh, 51 people might, or 50 people, and then some territories might have my job. Instead of having everybody doing their own thing, let's come together and let's say, what does it really take to be college ready? What does it mean to be career ready? And then take it back from 12th grade, 11th grade, all the way down to kindergarten. And um, that's that's what what does it what does a child need to know and to be able to do? And four years in, the teachers are telling you what. Uh, we've, we've had some really positive remarks from teachers. I think they're excited about the way uh, the standards are arranged to, that really encourages children to think, um, trying to meet children where they are in their learning processes, helping children to be their own learners. Um, we know today if you ask someone to, to learn how to do something, the first thing a lot of kids do is they pick up their iPhones and they start to, 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 to find out how to investigate how to do the learning themselves. Those are great tools. So. Um, People are excited about the application that can be um, generated from the standards. And um, I, so far, in the schools, now a lot of, you're, you're correct, there are some external concerns, but in the schools we're getting some really good feedback on what's happening with those standards. They're clear, they're more focused, um, and they could still be narrowed some more, um, but, but they're like that. Let's uh, switch gears. We that have our newest annual performance scores out. Why is, uh, we hear that 2014 2015 school year is very important in the IMSEP world. Why is that? Well, we, you know, IMSEP has been around since 1990, and this is actually our fifth revision of the of the Missouri School Improvement Program. And when we moved into this new system, we, it was a, a pretty major rehaul of the accountability system. And so we said we'll give districts three years to acclimate themselves to the new system. We'd like to use multiple years of data, multiple APRs. And so in 2014, 2015, that's the first year that we will uh, at the di at the department's choice go ahead and make classification recommendations based upon MSIP 5. And those classifications, uh, it, it, a lot of these scores determine their accreditation status. Correct. Okay, I'm sorry. They but do, and we, but we do look at multiple APRs, and we also do want to take into account other measures when necessary, such as the stability and leadership, what's happening with their improvement planning, those sorts of things do come into play. But the overarching uh, way that we make the recommendations to the State Board of Education is by looking at uh, multiple years of annual performance reports. So scores. why is this year so important? This is a big year because it was well, year two. So last year we had uh, reports come out. This is the second year of having it. It's a really exciting year for us in that 56.6% uh, of our districts did show improvement over prior year. So that's a, that's a big a step for us. 97% of our districts scored over 70% of the points uh, necessary, which uh, which would be at the fully accredited level. So our districts are rising to the occasion, they're working hard, they're getting the job done, and, and we're really excited and pleased to see that. Something we've heard on this show before is that things like MSEP don't take into account things like poverty, mobility, other challenges that teachers face that students are, are up against. Uh, do, do, you, do you recognize that? Where, where, where do we stand yeah, on addressing I think, that? Yeah, I think, you know, you can certainly make the a clear case that poverty matters, mobility matters. We have tried to take that into account in the growth, uh, new, new to MSIP 5, we do have a growth measure for your grades four through eight in mathematics and English language arts that does uh, take into account those factors and they're, to date we have not shown any correlation between those. That's the one area that we can show that. I think what these reports do tell us is that, yes, I think it matters, but what are we going to do then about that? that? Then the next question follows. What are we going to do about that? I think um, that's when we start moving towards what kind of interventions make a difference for kids, of pov for children of poverty? What kind of interventions do we need for uh, districts who, who have a, a very mobile population? Because that's really across the state, the mobility. Uh, we're going to talk more about that as the show progresses tonight. Margie Van Dieven from Desi, thanks for your time. Great, we appreciate thank it. you. Uh, we also want to hear from you, so find us with hashtag stay tuned STL. Here's what you're saying already.
Okay, next we're coming back to our, uh, our, our round table that's not exactly round to talk with some educators about what's working in our education system here in Missouri in the St. Louis region. Uh, but before we do that, Anne Marie Berger went to one district that is using data to make some gains. After their community made national headlines about the police shooting death of Michael Brown and the protests that followed, the more than 12,000 students from preschool through 12th grade enrolled in schools in the Ferguson Florissant School District are back in the classroom. At the 17 elementary schools, three middle schools, and three high schools, the district is working hard to maintain their good standing in the state of Missouri. Much of this responsibility comes under the leadership of Farhad Jadali, the Assistant Superintendent and Chief Information Officer for the Ferguson Florissant School District. Their achievement or their progress is really our business. We are, like many other businesses, we are in business of education. And our job is to increase the student achievement. That's the primary goal. Increasing student achievement is the goal of all school districts, especially when district performance and ranking is so important and accreditation is on the line. In 2013, the Missouri Department of Elementary and Secondary Education implemented the latest version of the Missouri School Improvement Program, also known as MSIP-5. MSIP is the system used to measure the performance of school districts around the state and a district's report card is based on the percentage of points they score on a 140-point system. School districts that earn 90 percent and above of the points on the MSIP-5 scale will be accredited with distinction. Districts that earn 70 to 89.9 percent will be accredited. Those that fall between 50 and 69.9 percent will be provisionally accredited. And school districts that earn below 49.9 percent will be unaccredited. Nice job, give a round of applause to Alexa. She's our first bingo winner. The Ferguson Florissant School District earned 97 points, scoring a 69.3 on the MSIP 5 scale. That's less than one percentage point away from losing their full accreditation. The state won't intervene until they have three years of MSIP 5 data. So Jadali is collecting his own data to improve achievement now. When I look at these type of information, they're telling me that mm, 2012 and 2013, my sixth grade teachers, they did something magical that they were able to move these kids from whatever their ranking was in the state of Missouri to a higher level. And this also tells me that I need to focus on my fourth grade in that school. Something is not working. My responsibility is to give information to our staff, our administration, to our teacher and our students so they can gauge their progress throughout time and be able to make uh, decisions that is direct, concise, and effective. I can go and to do this, Jadali established example. School Grounds, a series of applications used to collect data to measure a student's progress across all aspects of academics from kindergarten through 12th grade. This tracking of these students from everything from their health to their attendance to how they did in a pop quiz yesterday Absolutely. is constant and ongoing. It's not every eight weeks, let's look at this child. It's all the time. Absolutely. The tradition was paper reports was being generated. We would go in somebody's office. We would sit. So when a question would come up, we could open it and look at it. The times have changed. We started creating systems that in an instant you can look systems that you can immediately not waste time, three clicks, that's the maximum number of clicks, you get any information that you want. And when I say any, I literally mean any. We can go and look at from how many push-ups, how many setups a student can do to, to their achievement level, to their attendance, their past progress, look at that level from, from the lowest level, look at our teachers' success, how successful they are in inducing knowledge in our students, look at each one of our schools, to see throughout time what are their strengths and weaknesses and all the way up. Jadali considers this an early warning system and a proactive approach to improving student achievement district-wide and scoring higher on the MSIP 5 scale. Data-driven, we have to look at data and be able to see in every facet of it. 
attendance, student performance, the discipline referrals, everything that is going to impact the student achievement, we have to look at it. We cannot just no longer just make decisions based on gut feeling. For Stay Tuned, I'm Anne Marie Berger. So let's uh, talk about the state of public education and what is working. Uh, I'll introduce the guests at our table here tonight. Uh, joining us uh, from the Pattonville School District is Superintendent Mike Fulton. Uh, well, thanks for coming back to the show. Also, uh, welcome back to Brittany Packman, Executive Director of Teach for America, and Ed Johnson, Principal of Brentwood High School. Uh, so, Ed, I'll put it to you uh, first. What, what is the, in, from your perspective, the state of public education right now? Well, I'll speak from my small school, small school district perspective. Um, I think in the midst of everything that's going on, I, I would say that, that educators are really doing a wonderful job uh, being soldiers for education and really standing in the gap for kids. Uh, it's a lot of mandates being forced on us now, a lot to, to monitor and, and pay close attention to. But I think, again, in the midst of everything, I think there's some wonderful uh, teaching and learning practices going on in school districts. Tran transfers uh, kind of be kind of seem to have the headlines maybe and, uh, and a few other things we're talking about but we have some good we have some good schools is that right absolutely. we absolutely do that, we call that a softball in the <laughs> <laughs> so i'm supposed to say that in, right? in the biz. um we we absolutely do and i think um, what's necessary to remember about that is that especially in the schools in which Teach for America serves and a lot of our educators, uh, the state of education is necessarily urgent, right? So every kid only has one year in the third grade, mm -hmm. one year in the fourth grade, and then when so many of our students are coming in behind, they need those additional supports and they need that level of urgency from educators of all stripes. And so when we see that excellent teaching and learning happening across the board, I think the real question is how do we learn from it? How do we share those best practices with one another? Because it's not about who invents it, it's about figuring out what's best for all of our students. Mike, what's working? Well, I think what's working in a lot of school districts is uh, a focus on children and their learning needs. Schools are beginning to realize you can't do a one-size-fits-all approach to education. You're going to have to customize the learning environment to the kids that you serve, and that's good. I think the other thing that we're seeing is uh, a districts doing a lot better job of planning. You know, if you're, if you're going to succeed, you have to have a plan. And that plan in education has to focus on really two key components. One is student achievement with clear measurables that you're going to monitor on an on a almost daily basis. But also really focus on kids learning to become responsible citizens. Those two things go together. And so uh, it's exciting to see the work that's going on in a number of districts of really holding themselves accountable to high learning standards, but also trying to create learning environments that aren't driven completely by standardized testing. Um, when we get to the point where standardized tests drive everything that we do, then we've lost learning as uh, the first and most important focus of a school. On Twitter, people are asking, you know, we have some success stories, but not everyone has access to those. You know, is, that, is that improving at all, do you see? Success stories. Uh, and in terms of, you know, if you go to one district, your education outcomes are fantastic okay. and, and you're on a great track. That may not be the case. We know it's not the case for, for everyone. I think, I think a key element, a, a, a key thing that um, really drives quality uh, education and for kids is to have uh, a support system in place. I think it starts with the community. I, I think resources need to be provided to certain communities in, in order for them to support the school districts. Um, what works for us is we have a very supportive uh, school community uh, and also a very uh, supportive school board. And so uh, administrators in our school district are really able to benefit from that. And, and in turn, we, we support our, our teachers because, of course, they're, they're the hands-on professionals. And uh, our kids benefit from it. But again, it's about support. And, and you'll hear this a thousand times, and it still holds true. It's all about building positive relationships with uh, community members, uh, particularly kids and parents. Uh, you want them to be on board. And you want them to feel comfortable about uh, school as a place where they can come and, and be accepted and have every opportunity. 
I think we have to think really broadly about what that community is, though. So this past summer, Teach for America, we were actually really excited to launch for the first time ever a localized training institute. So traditionally, our teachers would go all over the country to learn how to be teachers and then bring that back to their home state. And what we did was we said, let's actually continue to invest in St. Louis. And we um, were very thankful to partner with St. Louis Public Schools and UMSL in order to be able to do that. But even more broadly, right, besides that institutional partnership that's incredibly unique, we had people like Bowen and the Crawford Taylor Foundation bringing their resources to bear to invest in students on the north side of the city. And so what we saw actually was that in just 19 days of teaching, we actually had 23 points um, on average that our students grew, which is just an astronomical amount of growth, especially over the summer when there are lots of distractions for our kids. And so when we think about a traditional college of education, um, an alternative route to teaching like Teach for America, a traditional public school district, and the business community, parents, um, and other leaders coming in and rallying around what's possible and really innovating thoughtfully, there's a lot that can happen uh, really well in our schools when that community rallies around our students. So is it hard to find the balance between this passion that you guys are talking about, the, the community getting involved in kind of the necessary business of a standardized test, or, or is, it, is, is it really necessary, these tests that you're saying can be? Well, it's, it, it hasn't been difficult for us to find the balance. I mean, I, I think a lot of the success in Pattonville is built off of this whole, so, uh, this whole concept of having a connected community. Relationships matter. Now, you can, in the course of building strong community relationships, also set the bar high for academic learning. In fact, you must. And we use standardized tests to get a gauge on how we're, our kids are doing, both in terms of their own learning, how we're doing in terms of improvement and making our systems better, and also how our kids are competing against kids in other school districts. Um, but that doesn't mean that you have to set up an environment that is unfriendly to kids, unfriendly to creating great learning structures. Um, our high school uh, with the course exams has knocked it out of the park in terms of their performance. And yet when you walk into our high school, it's very much about kids engaging in the learning process. It doesn't look like they're preparing for a standardized test. And I would say that's true of all of our schools. Uh, we have see great teaching and learning going on every day. That's, that's what's really fun. Is, you, you talked about urgency, Brittany. Do you see that urgency in the community that, 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 that you'd like to? I absolutely believe so. I do not think that at any other time, and at least in, as I've been growing up in St. Louis, education has been on the hearts, minds, and lips of our community as much as it has been over the last year for whatever reason. If it's because of Ferguson, if it's because of school transfers, people have been talking about what's happening for our children and most importantly, what's happening for our most underserved children. So I certainly um, feel that sense of urgency and people are really saying we have to get this right for the future of our region. Really? You're not, that's not, that sounds great. I love, I, I love your enthusiasm. Honestly, but so I moved back home a year and a half ago to lead Teach for America from, after spending six years in D.C. because of that sense of urgency, because I said this is a place where we can actually get it done. When we think about the size of our school districts, it, it's totally possible for St. Louis to lead the charge on this. You see this as well, you think? Well, absolutely. I mean, we just have to collaborate and join forces with other school districts. I think we have to make ourselves available for those school districts that are having difficulty and are faced with challenges. So uh, I think it's about professional network and, and, and again, extending uh, your, your support to districts that, that need you. That's absolutely vital right now that we all partner in this effort together. So. Um, what, what, what would you duplicate if you could as a principal, maybe brag on yourselves a little bit as that superintendent? What, what, what do you do on a daily basis that you think is working that, that, that could be replicated? I, personally, I'd, I'd say, you know, you, you hear a lot about the Common Core Standards, Missouri Learning Standards, but there's a, a lot of attention being uh, paid to teaching 21st century skills and making uh, sure kids understand uh, skills like uh, grit, resilience, perseverance, life skills that they need to uh, be successful later on in life that, again, are not quite the standards, but absolutely essential uh, to a kid's success. So I think you see uh, educators as coaches now. I think, I think we're forced to coach more now than ever. Uh, kids have a lot on their minds, so we have to be able to connect with them to uh, inspire them to, to want to learn at a higher level. M mentor. It's, Absolutely. It's what comes to mind. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I share the excitement for collaboration. There's more collaboration going on right now, I, I feel, in St. Louis than there has been in uh, 
previous years. And I say that based on 20 years of experience. There is a deep commitment to making sure that every child in our community gets a great education. And there's more work to be done on that in terms of how the best way to do that uh, is to carry it out. But um, that's, that has changed a lot over the last 20 years in terms of people's commitment to each other and to making schools better. Um, I think that's a perfect segue to uh, where Jim Kircher went. Thank you all for your time. We appreciate it. Thank uh, you. Uh, the Nine Network's Jim Kircher is going to show us uh, what a community school looks like, uh, what success at a community school looks like at Brittany Woods Middle School. Here's Jim. The saying that a challenge has a lot of moving parts takes on a whole new meeting when you're the principal of a middle school. Your middle school is where it's at. If I, you know, I came in working at a middle school because I believe that a lot of the decisions for the rest of their lives are made between 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. It was last spring when we went to Brittany Woods Middle School in University City, a community proud of its diversity, although not everybody sends their kids to the public schools. Brittany Woods is 75% African American, 60% of the kids are getting free or reduced lunches, and like a lot of schools with those kinds of numbers, too many kids are not performing at grade level. The most recent state numbers put the school district close to falling into provisional accreditation. When you really are looking at working with kids and, and helping kids that are underserved or have a lot of um, struggles coming from different places, they need a lot more resources. And so to ensure that they get those, you can't just lay it on the classroom teacher. You have to really look and see what kind of community resources can we bring in? Who else is skilled and knows knowledge about working with youth and development? Who can help? And Brittany Woods is drawing on the resources of 16 organizations in something called a Community School Initiative. It's designed to make schools community centers, and there are dozens of activities and events addressing a variety of needs of students and their families. And the academic part of this goes far beyond after-school tutoring. So if I put acid on this marble, quote unquote, should it bubble if it's metamorphic and it doesn't have calcite in it? No. When this I is Megan Eberly's science class. Maybe you remember learning about igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary rocks. Her challenge, you might say, is bringing those rocks to life. But I want mine to be like, kind of like this with different colors in it. So the kids today are using what they've learned to design a kitchen and choose a countertop. Will it absorb and stain? How do you clean it? How much will it cost? Also in this class today is Rachel Riccirello. She's from Washington University's Institute for School Partnership. For this class, she was able to bring in rock samples and microscopes at times, but her real contribution is the science. We started this unit with meeting with a Washington University faculty member who does research on water chemistry and carbon sequestration, so she studies rocks right now because um, rocks can feel old and they can feel like why are we studying rocks and so that professor actually came in worked with the students Megan and I worked with her to develop some hands-on labs that related to the acidification of the ocean and how acids affect rocks and brought it back to how water and rocks interact. The reason like the school partnership is so wonderful is it makes me a very efficient teacher. A lot of other community schools really do an awesome job on after-school programming and not to diminish their work, but we haven't seen a school that's been able to embed the instructional pieces into the after-school programming in a full encompassing program. The challenge isn't necessarily finding people who want to help, it's choosing the right ones. Angelo Lewis, the school and community liaison, works with kids and families and helps match their needs to potential outside partners and volunteers and not everybody gets in the door. It's difficult at times because there are so many people who want to help, and that's a great thing, um, but it, it's really based on what our kids want, what our families want, and then also what the school needs. The time that the kids here are at school, we can't waste with a partner that's not going to be using it to the full potential. All right, okay. So what does the rubber chicken have to do with all of this? Well, it gets your attention. All right, who can give another kind it's of It's Charlene West's way of warming things up when she comes to Miss Alsebrook's seventh grade social studies class. Whoever has the chicken gets to talk. So what we're going to do now is we're going to... She is with the Wyman Center, another one of Brittany Wood's major community partners. She's here full time running the teen outreach program and comes to every seventh grade social studies class once a week. So your project for CSL, you decided it was refugees, this is part of what's called community service learning. 
The Social Studies Unit is on human rights, and she's helping the kids plan ways to help refugees who have settled in St. Louis, tying the classroom lessons to their own community. Well, you know, with seventh graders, they're very moody <laughs> kids. But I do notice that when it's a day for Wyman, they're excited. They're excited, they're ready to learn, they're eager to learn. But this can't be some kind of feel-good approach to learning. Everything has to go back to student achievement because if the kids aren't at or above grade level when they leave Brittany Woods, we haven't done our job. There are those who say Brittany Woods is a school that's getting better. If that's true, it will help the district maintain its full accreditation when it gets its report card from the state next year. For Stay Tuned, I'm Jim Kircher. So for this table, let's talk a little bit about the way our kids learn uh, in light of some of the things we've talked about already tonight. Uh, joining us once again on the program, uh, Dr. Alex Cuenca, a professor of education at St. Louis University, and Bijal Desai Ramirez, executive director of education innovation at University of Missouri St. Louis College of Education. I think that's the perfect title. That's exactly what we're kind of talking about <laughs> yep. here, Alex. I mean, so so help us, let's just kind of clear this up a little bit more. So when, when people talk talk about Common Core, mm -hmm. that's not a that's not a method of teaching. It's a it's a set of standards. Absolutely not. Yeah, it's a set of standards. It's a set of benchmarks that teachers are expected to meet and reach. So it certainly is not dictating the curriculum. Teachers are able to select, choose, districts are able to select and choose their own, their own curricula. Um, I think the, the, the question becomes the connection between standardization and standards and assessments and standards. I think that's what we generally leave out of the equation. I think that's what forces teachers' hands sometimes. That's why they feel boxed in and constrained because they had a, a set of these standardized assessments that they have to meet which speak to the standards as they should. Um, but what's stuck in the middle is curriculum and so how the teachers innovate, how the teachers work to meet those standards pinned against those assessments, that is the, 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 the big struggle for teachers. So do they need to change the way they're teaching uh, outside of this common core conversation? Do, in, you said innovation. Is there, mm -hmm. is there an evolution of the way we educate that needs to be taking place here? Yeah, I think that there already is sort of an evolution of the way that educators are teaching. So in my role, I have the great opportunity to see a lot of the really innovative things that teachers and administrators are doing in their classrooms, schools, and districts. And so those range from some of the things we've already heard tonight, like a community school model, to um, using and leveraging student data, all the way to um, things like creating student incubators where students can start up their own companies and um, you know, creating maker spaces in schools where people can learn hands-on um, and get really practical skills and apply them in a very creative way. So there's a range of things that people are doing to um, you know, kind of go back to what Alex is, was saying, to meet those standards and benchmarks, but in a way that um, meets the learner where they are. And, and, the, and the learners are learning differently. I, I have to believe, I think it was Margie from Desi was talking about the iPhone. I mean, mm -hmm. everybody knows a child that can't talk yet, but they can run an right. iPad almost, it right. seems like. Oh, right. my daughter. Yeah, but that's my <laughs> daughter as well. Uh, you know, absolutely, I mean, I think students, their relationship with knowledge, their relationship with how they uh, access knowledge, understand knowledge is going to be fundamentally different, it's continuing to be fundamentally different. And so as we progress to prepare teachers, to uh, provide professional development for teachers, we have to continually adapt and almost catch up because technology itself is you know, moving so quickly that we are almost playing a catch-up game uh, with our teachers sometimes. Is there an emphasis on the math and the language arts that we're hearing about with some of these standards? And, and does it need to be those particular subjects? Or, or, or we've also heard critical thinking is, mm -hmm. the, is, a, is something we should be teaching? Yeah, so I think common core standards are specifically targeted towards um, English language arts and mathematics. But um, as Margie mentioned, within Missouri Learning Standards, there are standards for social sciences and science as well. Um, so maybe for that conversation, it's um, focused on ELA and math. But um, I think you know, in terms of having standards and benchmarks, they're there across all subjects. Um, in terms of sort of the focus on thinking, I think that the um, Common Core standards have created that shift nicely to focusing on thinking and developing um, critical thinking skills. And um, again, back to Alex's point, you know. 
gone are the days when people need to memorize the facts and so they can look those up immediately. Mm -hmm. And so it's more about how do you navigate all of that information? How do you teach students and equip students to um, find the appropriate information and to think on their feet when they're faced with new information? Well, I'll also add that, that across this notion of, of what we're assessing, I think what the danger is is in this entire movement towards standardization that I feel like we're getting students that although the standards are speaking to these critical thinking aspects that we are also using very convergent thinking with you know bubbling in the right answer and getting these kind of the, the, the this data system that we're creating so certainly we need the data to help us understand what's occurring in classrooms um, but I'm, I'm not as optimistic I guess that, uh, that that the kind of critical thinking that we need uh, to help us solve big complex problems are answered by selecting one of four answers on a test and then using that data to tell us something meaningful about the classroom. There has to be more. Uh, the, the, the package that you ran earlier regarding human rights, you know, they turned that into, well, human rights, uh, trying to figure that out and then trying to connect it to achievement data. Um, there should be a place in our education system for an, a deep understanding of human rights and we should be able to capture that in a way that is meaningful. Um, we can't solve complex problems like what's occurring in Ferguson um, with just select the right answer. There is not one single right answer. We need deep, complex thinking from our future citizens. Um, and, and we need an education system and a set of standards that speaks to that and a set of assessments that also help us get there. So, so do we need to be able to measure whether we're succeeding in that goal? Do we? I mean, if the, the things you're talking about are kind of, uh, they're not very tangible. They're not, but, but there are ways to capture them. There are ways to, 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 to value when students walk out of a school uh, in protest for Michael Brown. That should be capturable. We should be able to, to, to take some of that, that data, um, count that as data, count that as measurable, count that as evidence of learning, of citizenship, of our students operating and working in a democracy to solve a big problem, to have their voice in a democracy. That should be part of this entire scheme. Uh, we've heard a lot about business. We've heard a lot about you know, jobs, and a, a purpose of education is absolutely jobs, but it's also about democracy. It's also about uh, deep critical thinking, um, you know, in the way that I think is positioned in the standards, but that isn't really currently assessed in education. What are the, um, you're teaching the teachers, what are they saying? What, what, what are their concerns? What are, what are they, what's the feedback you get from them? So, um, we, I have overhauled and changed a lot of how we're preparing in-service teachers as well as, I'm sorry, pre-service teachers as well as how we provide professional learning opportunities for in-service teachers. And so um, to that point, we're trying to work on providing new ways of, new opportunities. Um, one of our faculty members has developed the Cultural Competency Institute to get to exactly that. So it's kind of trying to provide um, and help teachers develop an understanding of the context in which students learn, as well as um, helping think about what they're learning and kind of the goals of those benchmarks and standards as well. Does this, does this require more, a more personal way of teaching or a, a more personal involvement by the community? Something that you can't just uh, bubble in, as you said? I, absolutely, I mean, I think a community is, is a key partner in teacher preparation and teacher education. Uh, something that I think, you know, Brittany's doing really well. Uh, and something that I think, at least uh, to me for me, I think we can learn from uh, as uh, education institutions in terms of how to bring the community into our classrooms and bring our classrooms into the community. Uh, I, I think they're, they're vital partners and, and, and partners that we can hope to continue to, to, to reach out to. Let's bring everyone back to the table. And while we do that, let's uh, check in with what you're saying on social media and we'll come right back and continue this conversation. So we're just continuing the conversation uh, that we just had, and, and we were kind of saying that 
uh, Dr. Cuenca, what you were talking about there, uh, this idea of democracy. A lot of times we are very focused on, um, for lack of a better word, kind of the bottom line of mm -hmm. e even an individual's bottom line, and that mm -hmm. and these outcomes are mm -hmm. are all kind of uh, justifiably uh, about the individual. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like you're talking about we need something. Uh, I don't know if greater is the word, but something a little more external. All I think I need to do is we need we need to repurpose our the way that we think about education. We need to have a conversation about purposes, and and I think what we've been left with is economic purposes, and and that's okay. You know, we students need to find jobs, uh, but we also need to think about what the broader purposes of education ought to be: uh, citizenship, democracy, uh, searching for justice, equity. Those are things that need to be captured in some way, shape, or form. Um, through the state, with our schools, you know, our social studies teachers, I'm particularly biased toward them, um, <laughs> but we need to find a way to capture this in some way, shape, and value that, value community investments. Uh, if we simply just look at ELA and math standards and how those things are helping us get jobs or get into college, which I'll argue college is also a career-focused enterprise, so you go to college to get a job, which means that standards are career and career ready. If we're simply focusing on that, then then it's a very myopic vision of what our society um, should look like in the future. That's especially necessary for underserved students, mm -hmm. right? So education is supposed to be the pathway to equity. Right. If you're not focused on equity through right. education, it can't be a pathway, especially for those kids right. that are in marginalized groups, first-generation American students, mm -hmm. people, young people growing up in poverty. It's mm -hmm. impossible if we don't take that focus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are we giving our students enough credit? To say, these are some pretty lofty ideas we're talking about. The, can, can, can our kids handle these kind of? Uh, oh, kind our, of our kids can handle it. You know, the thing is, is you never underestimate what kids can do. I don't care what, what kind of life situation a child comes out of. They are capable of remarkable <coughs> things. But we have the obligation in schools to set a high bar and design our schools to help kids reach that bar. And if we do that, then when they get out of school and head into college or career, they are gonna do absolutely fine. Part of it is academics, part of it's work ethic, Part of this learning to problem solve and think independently. And all of that has to come together in a mixture that goes way beyond just standardized testing. And I'm not diminishing the role of assessment, it's critical. But it's not all that there is to the learning process. Well, Mike, are schools structured to do all that? I think increasingly they are. It all depends on how much you're willing to customize your school to the learners that you serve. And, and what I see, at least happening in, in, in our school district and in others too, is that we're beginning to do a much better job of asking how do we build schools around our learners while keeping the bar for uh, academic expectations and uh, work ethic high. And uh, it's gonna be a, an ever evolving process, but it's a heck of a lot of fun. And the kids are capable of incredible accomplishments and we're seeing it every day with our kids. What's next uh, for education in, in this in this state? <laughs> Easy question. <laughs> well, there's a lot of there's Well, we've a talked a lot of, we've talked about <laughs> innovation, we've talked about uh, some some uh, higher purposes perhaps and the way we teach kids to think. What's what's on the horizon? I think that is I think really what we are trying to talk more and more about is how do we make the educational opportunities in our schools meaningful for the children. We want to engage the children in the learning activities at hand, help them become their own learners, uh, remain very focused on um, helping them identify early on what it is that they'd like to pursue and, and make the learning meaningful. Um, I, I don't think anyone at this table and anyone would disagree that standardized testing is the only focus. Right now it is something that we do once a year at, our, at the state level. We, we have to move away from over testing and under assessing. Assessment is critical and teachers do it every day. Learners do it every day. Teachers assess themselves. Students assess themselves. That's where we're heading. Um, I, I do have to say though that there is a role I believe still for standardized testing if we do want to come up with some measurement or, or of, of accountability will not go away it is still on the horizon so what's the best way to do that uh, when we talk about certain children have um, harder times taking standardized tests we see that but the reality is when they exit our schools to be a doctor a lawyer a teacher a cosmetologist a carpenter you have to take standardized testing so until we we do we want to continue the pattern of of uh, 
of setting certain types of students up for disadvantages? I don't think so. So how do we tackle that so that every child is served and ready to leave our schools for success? Do our, do, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. One of, the, one of the things that's gonna be critical down the road is when we assess children, the assessment needs to have a learning purpose to it. And one of the challenges that we face in Missouri is, is at the high school level, the assessments are, are clear. It's a clear target. You know the target that you're trying to hit, and it's a target worth aiming for. And if we can now with the MAP assessment, the three through eight assessments, create that same kind of clear target, then we're gonna have much better luck working with children, particularly children who are um, in poverty, and with poverty often comes a lot of mobility, they're moving around to different schools. We need to have a crystal clear target that we can aim for so we can help kids um, do really well in school. We need to teach kids to read. We need, they need to know uh, about mathematics. They, they need to develop competencies in these areas. So did we go about this backwards? Should we not have those clear goals for the younger grades first to, to build on there? Is it, is it hard to do if you didn't have those, those clear goals to start with? Well, the, the standards are fine, but now when we actually get to the assessments, the assessments need to narrow down and really focus on the most important learning that kids need to actually walk out of school with or walk into the next grade level with. And so doing that will help a lot, especially when you're working with high poverty populations. Okay, I have a list of questions that are in my brain as we speak and we are out of time on the air, but we're gonna stay online at uh, staytuned.ninenet.org. Find us there, we'll keep talking uh, until next time. Stay tuned. Let's put the mic over Dale uh, because <laughs> because you cover this on a daily basis. What I know you're you're percolating there. What what what's on your mind? What what do you want to ask the people that you have to track down all the time? They're all right here. <laughs> They're all right here. That's, well, I guess what's on my mind is you know, Margie's talking about assessment, and we just got all the test scores, and we see that some districts did better, some districts did worse, some districts are on the bubble. And I know that uh, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has a plan to step in and help districts when they need help. Can the department handle all these districts? I mean, there's, I know that you've got a ton of people in Normandy because the state took over Normandy and they need, need the most help. If every district that scores below 75 is gonna get help from Jefferson City from the state, do you have enough people to give that help? Uh, capacity is certainly something that we need to all be paying quite a bit of attention to, um, and, and it doesn't need to just come from the state itself for those interventions and the support that we're talking about. Uh, Mike and I were talking earlier about um, how a number of educators across the city and state are, are really wanting to assist wherever they can um, to intervene and to support people that need the support and interventions. Um, I do want to remind us that 97% of our districts are doing great and and you know it's, it's we're talking about 3% of our districts in the state that uh, we want to ensure never get into the position that we're in with Normandy. This is about early intervention. This is about really trying to to get in and make a difference early on. The earlier you intervene as with any kind of situation the more success I believe you're going to have. You don't want to wait till, till it's uh, the unaccredited level. So capacity is certainly a question that we'll need to be addressed um, but right now uh, you know again we, we just need to look at what we have in the state and we need to look to all of our partners in, in, the, in the state to work together. Would all of this be so much simpler if we had uh, more money in, in education? <laughs> Do we need a lot more money? I don't I don't always tend to think money is the answer. Money certainly helps, right, in order to build that capacity to get talented people to ensure the partners can do the great work that they need to do. But this, to me, is really a question of mindset, right? So if we've got all of the resources in the world, what are we going to put those resources to and how are we going to ensure that there is equitable education happening across the board for all of our students? So just throwing money at the problem doesn't actually solve things. If, if that were the case, then we probably wouldn't be in the position we're in right now. Yeah, I think with money, money is an important factor, but use the money you have uh, wisely first and make sure that you're using it to the very best of its ability. And then at some point, it's, it's very likely that more resources are going to be needed. We certainly know that we need more resources for early childhood. 
Um, we may need more resources to help kids get caught up to grade level that are two or three grade levels behind because the intensity of the supports that are needed are significant. So money does become an issue at some point, but for every district, just use the resources that you, that you have wisely. And, and then, and only then, do you start to then ask what more do we need in terms of money? I will say though, there's, no. there's, there's an irony though in um, increasing the standards and rigor of our standards and then divesting in education. And I think that, that I think is where, where a lot of the anxiety is coming from teachers regarding Common Core implementation because um, the, 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 the professional development is a little spotty in terms of, okay, what do we do now? Because it, it might change, it might not change in two years. And so it's putting districts in these kind of really strange positions and at the same time we're, we're not investing as much as we should. So we're increasing the standard, but we're not investing as much as we should in education. And so it's, it's, it's putting districts in these really strange priority patterns. Um, and so to me, I, I think they have to go hand in hand. I think wisdom is correct, is, is priorities is correct. All of these questions are correct, but we can't do both at the same time. We can't say we're going to give you less and expect more. It's going to create these huge gaps that are problematic. There's so many shifts taking place now. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, teachers who have been in the practice for so long, I mean, they, they literally have to uh, start off and really uh, begin to branch out into new learning. And so the professional development piece is crucial. And I'm not so sure that it's caught up to the speed where it needs to be to really offer districts that really need intense support. I don't think the professional development is, is quite there yet where it needs to be to really help teachers with all of the new mandates and all of the new practices <clears throat> that they'll be required to do here in the near future. Has teaching ever changed as fast as it's changing right now? I mean, I, you know, the technology changes, the social media changes. I mean, Facebook's no longer cool. I'm just telling you. <laughs> I don't know if any of you knew that or not. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm just, I, I, I got to imagine, so I'm just trying to think of like some bad analogy of, you know, you're working on a, a line on a, a building a car. You know, that's been the same for, obviously that's changed too. But I'm just saying, as a teacher, I would imagine in the last 10 years, it changed more than how many previous years. And, and that's where someone's late in their career or mid halfway through their career, they need, they need some education as well. So I think what I hear you saying. That's exactly right, because <clears throat> programs have changed since they've gone through programs. So now uh, teachers need to know how to use research-based strategies to measure uh, you know, the high impact that that learning would have on, on, their, on their children in their classroom. And that's a whole uh, learning piece within itself. I mean, it, it really uh, creates another layer of learning for teachers on top of all of the other things that they're, they're left to deal with. But I would say uh, for administrators, the best thing to do is keep your teachers loose and keep them happy and, and really uh, don't forget about the human element. I mean, teachers are human beings and they deserve to be supported. And the number one thing that you can do is, is, is to be a servant leader. Uh, that, that's what I prefer because I really think that teachers are the ones that we need to protect from all of these new mandates that are coming down the pike because things tend to change so much. Uh, but one thing you're going to need is for teachers to hang in there and, and stay strong and, and really endure uh, this test of time until we find out something that really works for our kids. Yeah, so, oh, oh, I was just going to say one thing that's where, to your point about professional learning and professional development, that's where UMSL is really trying to step up to the plate and change what we're doing. Brittany mentioned that um, Teach for America was partnering, UMSL is partnering with Teach for America for um, some of the teacher candidates who are transitioning to teaching, but we're also changing a lot of what we're doing for in-service teacher prep. Um, so we have now a Bachelor's of Education Studies, which is focused on folks who are going into um, informal education organizations like the Science Center, um, like the Magic House. And so people that are not necessarily pursuing a teaching certification still get those um, effective, mm -hmm. high leverage teaching practices um, under their belt as they work with kids. And so those same things are taught to, of course, teachers that are pursuing certificates. Um, similarly, we're revamping and overhauling everything that we're doing with professional learning opportunities for 
um, in-service teachers. Um, so we're really looking at improving the talent pipeline by developing educators as innovators and helping them with developing design thinking skills, um, helping them, helping education entrepreneurs who are starting up entities really get that foundational education concept down tight. And so while we're partnering with other entities in the startup ecosystem to help them build out the you know financial and business model and the capitalization plan and whatever else, we will focus on the education concept. Um, I guess so some really things haven't changed though. I mean, you're, what you're talking about, that's, that's, well, that's wisdom that it works uh, over, the, over the ages and, and also the community stuff we're talking about. That's, mm -hmm. uh, that's not, it's not maybe new and maybe, maybe implementing it is new. Or, but one of the things that I think we need, to, the, the career technical educators are really great examples of this. They have talked about, what, what you hear everyone talking about is developing the critical thinking skills and that's why they go back to the self-learning skills and that sort of thing because even the, a career technical program can no longer tr train a child for a specific uh, career and, and expect them to be able to go out and enter into that workforce ready for that specific training program that they've developed because in three years that's extinct and they've moved on to entirely new programming. So what they're training and even the, in the career programs too is how to think, how to self-learn, how to keep engaged. Teachers have to do the same thing. Our profession has trained, as you just mentioned, has changed drastically. Change is always a challenge for everyone, but we need as educators to stay up, um, stay engaged in what's happening and change the way we do things as well. Yeah. Okay, well